Okay, we're on. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we have a very special session for the lecture series today. We have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Fahad al sumait all the way from Kuwait, up on our screen. Uh, he will be presenting today's lecture. Uh, let me just uh, tell you a bit about him. Uh, Associate Professor Fahad al sumait is, is Head and Assistant Professor of the Communications Department of the Gulf University of Science and Technology in Kuwait. He is also the founding member of the Association for Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Studies through the internationally re recognized uh, body Middle East Studies Association, also known as MESA. He has authored and edited a number of books, notably for this lecture. He has co-edited a book entitled The Arab Uprisings, Catalysts, Dynamics and Trajectories, which was published in 2015. He co-edited the book along with Dr. Nella Lenza and former MEI director, Professor Michael Hudson. Dr. El Sumit is not a stranger to Singapore. Uh, because he was actually based here at MEI for two years in 2011 to 2012. So uh, I'll now hand over the session to Dr. Elsmeet. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, I'll, yes, okay, good. Thank you. The, the, the body motions help because I can't hear you very well. Um, well, I'm delighted to be speaking to you today about uh, a topic that uh, um, is certainly a, a very a major one in terms of developments within the Middle East within uh, a generation. The Arab uprisings are perhaps uh, one of the most significant set of events, um, but they're also uh, events that leave us with a lot of questions. Um, as we move forward in time and we look at what were the outcomes of these uprisings, uh, it there are a lot of things uh, left, we might say, unresolved or in a state that's different from what many people expected. So um, I'm just going to start by giving you sort of a, a little overview. I think many of you are probably aware of how the uprisings sort of uh, were triggered. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what were some of the conditions that led to it. But uh, on December 17th of 2010, uh, there was a fruit vendor in Tunisia, in the city of uh, uh, Sidi Bouzid. Uh, and his name was uh, Mohamed Bouazizi. Many of you may have heard that name before. Uh, he, like many Tunisians, uh, had poor economic conditions, uh, was doing what he could to try and uh, make a living for his family. And uh, selling fruit was the way that he did this. Uh, and fruit vendors uh, in Tunisia like this often work without permits and are regularly subjected to uh, uh, humiliation, police intimidation, and that sort of thing. And on December 17th, uh, some police um, were harassing him, and it led to a bit of an altercation between him and a female officer who was alleged to have slapped him. They confiscated his cart, and, uh, and um, in protest, he went to the... Uh, uh, local government office to try and, and seek some sort of resolution to get his cart back. And uh, they uh, dismissed him. The local police apparently beat him again. And uh, his frustration at the conditions were so dire that he doused himself with a paint thinner and he lit himself on fire in front of the government building in protest with, uh, for his frustrations. Uh, he later died of the wounds, but the, um, the symbolism of the moment sparked uh, a lot of unrest. So in the days following uh, his self-immolation, a number of cities uh, across Tunisia started uh, rising up in protest. Word spread quickly about uh, his, his defiant act through social media. And um, in 28 days from the day that he lit himself on fire, a 23-year dictatorship uh, of uh, Zain al Abidin bin Ali was basically uh, uh, left. Uh, Zain al Abidin bin Ali uh, left the country uh, in fear for his life. The military didn't want to support him. Um, but it wasn't obviously just in that country where things went uh, bad for the dictator. The, um, the protests that started in Tunisia 
the same kind of effect of it being spread through social media, of people's frustrations being sort of uh, encapsulated in this act, um, inspired protests across the region. And so you had uh, in Libya, a uh, protest that led to the ouster of Muammar Gaddafi and the killing uh, of him. Uh, in Egypt, uh, Hosni Mubarak was kicked out of office eventually. In Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, also uh, ended up leaving office and, and going to Saudi Arabia in exile. Uh, Bahrain, there were protests uh, which got put down by force uh, by a coalition of uh, uh, military personnel from around the Gulf uh, countries. Um, in Syria, uh, the protests, uh, which started off peacefully, uh, have escalated into uh, one of the worst civil wars we've seen in decades. And there were also a number of street protests across uh, countries throughout the Arab world. It seemed to be a kind of contagion effect where um, this one act, in many ways uh, by uh, Mohammed Bouazizi, seemed to have unleashed uh, um, uh, tension beneath the surface uh, across the entire Middle East. Now, we're coming to the seven year anniversary of that event. Uh, it will be coming up next month. And as I said, when we look back at where we stand seven years uh, after these uh, tumultuous, tumultuous and, and uh, seismic revolutions that we saw, um, what do things look like? Well, if you follow the news, you know Libya, for example, is still in turmoil. Uh, all sorts of uh, different factions fighting for power throughout. Syria and Yemen find themselves in horrible civil wars with uh, major humanitarian uh, crises. Um, Iraq, although it had some protests, it's not often uh, talked about in terms of the Arab uprisings because you might say the political system there was broken before the uprising started. Uh, but there were a number of protests there, and we still see today that Iraq is uh, divided and highly unstable. Egypt has reverted to Mubarak, who was jailed and then freed. Um, but the current regime is in many ways more authoritarian uh, than uh, things were under uh, Hosni Mubarak. Bahrain, while the initial protests were quelled by force, uh, it's a boiling cauldron. Uh, there are still attacks. There was an attack last week uh, there on some police officers. There's a um, uh, very high potential that we're going to see things spark off in Bahrain again. In Tunisia, um, many people refer to that as not only the birthplace of the, the Arab uprisings, but the one country that seems to have been doing uh, the best out of all of them. Uh, people look at the moves toward uh, better institutions, better political structures, uh, better power sharing arrangements, uh, uh, new um, new political groups and, and women's organizations getting involved. Uh, but we should be cautious in how we think about how far Tunisia has come. Yes, it's come some ways compared to many of the others. And it's avoided some of the problems the others have. Uh, but the living conditions, the economic uh, situation, and the issue of security and stability are still problematic, uh, even in Tunisia. So, um, for this lecture, I want to talk to you a little bit about filling in the gaps between the initial story that I told you about Mohamed Bouazizi and where we find ourselves today uh, in terms of the situation in these various countries and across the region. Um, so, uh, this is an outline of, of what we're going to cover. I've given you the basic introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about some definitions. As academics, we always like to start with definitions before we get into things uh, and kind of tease out the notion of revolutions versus civil wars versus uprisings, Arab Springs versus Arab uprisings versus Arab awakenings. Um, and then I'm going to follow the basic format that we used in the edited volume, uh, which Sharif outlined for you at the beginning, the book that, uh, that I co-edited co -edited with Nelly and Michael. Um, and we're going to look at uh, what we call the sort of the catalyst and conditions. What were the things that created that, uh, that situation where it only took a small push uh, before we saw... Um, a, a lot of long-standing dictatorships and political systems uh, 
being unraveled uh, almost overnight. Then we'll move on to the dynamics. Uh, what kind of things did we see happening on the ground? What were some of the, uh, the key areas and the key elements that we need to take into consideration about uh, the uprisings themselves as they were happening? And then we'll move into the third category, which are uh, trajectories. Where do we predict things are going uh, to the best degree that we can? Predictions are always dangerous when it comes to politics. Uh, but what kind of um, expectations should we have in terms of uh, the long-term outcomes of these uprisings? And then I'll end with some uh, basic conclusions uh, to, to think about uh, before we turn it over to all of you for a Q&A. Now, because we're covering such a complicated topic that spans uh, nearly seven years now, uh, many would say that the preconditions for this certainly go back uh, decades, generations beforehand. We're talking about many different countries, and while many of them had similar uprisings, the conditions in each country uh, still had their own unique composition, um, and the trajectories of the countries are also uh, somewhat unique. Um, so given this complexity, I'm just going to give you sort of the high-level view. We're going to move through things, uh, broadly speaking, at the expense of depth. But if there are particular areas you'd like to explore more, we can do that during the Q&A session. So if that sounds good, uh, again, we're going to talk about the background and definitions. What were the preconditions? What did it look like on the ground uh, when the uprising happened and where did they go? Then we'll go ahead and get started. So as I said, we'd like to start with definitions. Now, there's been a lot of uh, names associated with this, and um, the nomenclature for understanding these things has a lot to do with our uh, conceptual schemata. And uh, I think it's important that we dissect a little bit what it is we're actually talking about, um, because it will impact the way in which we uh, think about the expectations and the outcomes of these events. So many people have called it the Arab uprisings, the Arab Spring, but they haven't called it necessarily the Arab revolutions, although we talk about them sometimes in terms of revolution. But I want to be clear that when we're talking about a revolution, the formal uh, definition of that is where you basically have a fundamental change in the political order and you have uh, the underlying part I have here, the substitution uh, of one government uh, by the governed. That is, the people who uh, undergo the revolution uh, overthrow the existing power structure and put in their own. That's not necessarily the case in most of the Arab uprising countries, which is why we don't necessarily call them revolutions, or at least at this point, not finished revolutions. Uh, because as you'll see, the um, power vacuums left by the exiting dictators in many of these cases uh, were filled by other uh, forces that were not the original protesters. I mentioned that Yemen and Syria uh, find themselves in the midst of a civil war. Just to be clear, why is this different from a revolution? Uh, well, a civil war is uh, where you have two, what are supposed to be somewhat equal sides battling each other. Um, in Syria, the opposition for coalition forces are made up uh, of many different kinds of groups. Uh, many of them proxies for other international and global powers, uh, which has allowed them to sustain uh, the fight uh, against Bashar al-Assad um, much longer than would have been expected and has moved what would have been the quelling of an uprising by his forces into a pro prolonged um, civil war. Uh, in Yemen, uh, you used to have two Yemens, north and south. Uh, they were united. Uh, and now they're looking at being divided again. Um, and so you have a number of groups within Yemen uh, also fighting. You have uh, various uh, international groups as well, Saudi Arabia, some would say Iran, uh, certainly trying to utilize the internal forces uh, for their own uh, geopolitical ambitions. Um, so while the sides aren't always seen as equal, the external forces can make them uh, appear to be so. Uh, the consequence of which is that these uh, moments that could have been revolutions or uprisings uh, end up becoming protracted civil wars. Then we have the uprisings themselves. Now, um, Mark Lynch, a uh, famous political scientist uh, of the Middle East, wrote an article in Foreign Policy magazine uh, 
where he described what was going on as an Arab Spring uh, in reference to uh, the uh, uprisings in 1848 across Europe, which were also referred to as Springs. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But one of the problems with, I think, this nomenclature is calling it the Arab Spring uh, gives you the idea that it's somehow temporal, that there's a particular time period. This is something that's happening according to a season. It's, it's now blossomed. It, spring brings up these positive connotations uh, with the expectation that you're going to enter into something uh, positive. But I don't think that the spring, as he called it, uh, is adequately characterized that way because we're not saying that this is something temporal. This is not a short-term a set of disruptions. The disruptions caused by these uprisings uh, are going to lead to um, uh, changes that will uh, be noticeable, I guess, over the course of many decades. So uh, I avoid the term Arab Spring. People have called it an Arab awakening. Another uh, point, again, to maybe caution you from using. Uh, awakening implies that there's somehow uh, the, the Arabs just woke up one day and decided to throw off the shackles of dictatorship. Uh, it's, it's sort of, I think, an ahistorical perspective because um, uprisings and, uh, and, and revolts within the Arab world are quite numerous. As a matter of fact, um, when we talk about uh, uh, basically since the end of uh, World War One. Uh, when the Ottoman Empire was dissolved and um, uh, the French and the British, uh, through the Sykes-Picot Agreement, drew up the borders of what we think of today as the modern Middle East. Uh, from that point forward, which was, uh, again, the end of World War I, uh, until the Arab uprisings, there were several dozen uh, examples of revolts, uh, attempted uprisings, um, and other kinds of disruptions across the Middle East. So this wasn't really an awakening. This isn't something, uh, when we're talking about the 2010-2011 period, uh, this wasn't new. What was new is that it was, it was the scale and the speed with which it spread, and importantly, the degree of uh, success is maybe a strong word, but the degree to which um, these uprisings did lead to uh, deposing long-standing dictatorships. That's what was new. So it wasn't necessarily awakening. Um, the, the, the conditions, as I'm going to talk about, that uh, inspired all of this uh, have been there for quite some time. So instead, uh, this is why I'm sticking with the terminology of the Arab uprisings uh, as an idea, a framework through which we conceptualize what happened. They're not revolutions that necessarily led to positive replacements by the people who, who rose up. Uh, they're not necessarily, in all cases, civil wars, and the civil wars are not necessarily between just the internal parties. There's very much geopolitical interest. It's not an ahistorical awakening or a temporal Arab Spring. They are uprisings. And as such, these uprisings, as I've said, uh, have had a number of uh, different catalysts that led to um, this set of conditions that we saw in 2010 and then 2011. And sometimes people want to find a single explanation. Was it because of the dictatorships? Was it because of the economic conditions? Was it because of social media? Um, many of you, if you were uh, paying attention to the news at that time, for example, would have heard of them talked about as the Facebook or the Twitter revolutions. Uh, and often it's, it's uh, tempting to try and find these monocausal explanations. That is one thing that can really say why it was different this time than the dozens of uprisings that have happened in the past throughout the Middle East. But I also want to caution you against that, because there is no single explanation. Rather, you might think of it as a perfect storm, if you're familiar with that term. That is, it was a number of different kinds of uh, uh, factors spread out uh, that just kind of had a confluence at a particular point in time. And this confluence is what led to the uprisings rather than one specific thing. So let's talk about this confluence. Uh, I'm going to discuss the political, economic, social, and media conditions, uh, which I would say characterize the majority of the conditions. Again, this is where I'm going to be moving relatively quick through uh, things that ideally require a lot more depth. 
Uh, so if you uh, have questions about any of these conditions, uh, we can discuss them more in the Q&A. So let's start with the political conditions. Um, I broke them down into roughly three categories, deep states, dysfunctional states, and dependent states. That is the, um, the governments uh, in each of these countries uh, that were affected by the uprisings and many of the countries that witnessed uh, protest movements and, and demonstrations, but not necessarily uh, large scale political uh, disruption, uh, share some commonalities. That is, uh, most of them have different degrees of authoritarianism. The governments have uh, strong control. Uh, the state exerts um, uh, its influence uh, over the economy, uh, over the media, uh, over uh, many aspects of people's lives. Um, uh, this is what we term authoritarianism, uh, as opposed to, say, a system of democracy. Now, not all of them are equally authoritarian, not all of them use the same tools necessarily, but to some degree or another, uh, each of the countries within the Middle East has some kind of uh, authoritarian uh, aspects to it. So we might call these the deep states. Um, perhaps related to that is the fact that these states are not necessarily effective in uh, providing their citizens with, uh, with all the things that citizens would expect. And because they're non-democratic, uh, citizens have very little say in terms of, uh, in most places, in terms of what goes on by the state. So the states tend to be heavily corrupt, largely inefficient. Uh, there's a high degree of what we call clientelism, that is dishing out asset, you know, state resources to particular patrons in order to buy their uh, acquiescence or to buy their, um, their loyalty to the state. Uh, these, these are common tools that we see, and you can understand where if you have corruption, inefficiency, and the state is being used as a, a way to buy influence, uh, that the states themselves are not very responsive to citizens' needs. As well, we have highly dependent states. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but the states uh, within the Middle East are very heavy food importers. They rely on external forces for things like security. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, power negotiations between regional hegemons, that is uh, different uh, countries within the region trying to exert, exert influence outside of the borders. Uh, and uh, they do this in many different ways. Um, and so as a result, you have a very uh, interlocking set of uh, political conditions where different states rely on each other for different kinds of things, sort of quid pro quo. Uh, for example, many of the uh, Gulf states, which have, uh, like Kuwait, where I am, which have uh, high uh, levels of, of per capita income, uh, are able to exploit things like labor and security from much larger states that maybe people are less well off. Um, and so the, there's, there's a lot of this trading back and forth, uh, which means that um, You've got, again, just to summarize this point, states that have high levels of authoritarianism in most cases, uh, that have inefficient governments, and the governments network with each other uh, to help maintain the uh, control and the flow of money, uh, security, and, and people. So it's what you might say a relatively unhealthy political environment, uh, which is very much part of the reason why the Middle East is in the news so much. Let's talk about economics. Um, the Middle East has a, a very uh, unique situation that we have some of the world's poorest and some of the rich, richest countries in the world all within the same region. Uh, we have countries like uh, Yemen and Egypt, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria, where uh, average levels of income are quite low. But we also have countries like Qatar or the UAE and Kuwait, where I am, where the average uh, per capita income are the highest in the world. And that's part of the reason why you have these interdependent states that I was talking about, uh, because of the economic flow. Um, you also have, as a result of the economic conditions, uh, the, this, um, this extreme set where you have some of the uh, poorest, I mean, some of the uh, highest levels of unemployment on one side and some of the lowest levels of unemployment on the other side with countries all within the same region. Uh, 
So uh, again, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's no uh, unified set of economic conditions across the region. As a matter of fact, there's no other place in the world where you have uh, such a stratification, you might say, between the haves and the have-nots as we have here within the Middle East. You add to that the point I made earlier uh, that these states economically uh, are interdependent uh, on each other and on foreign aid and on uh, foreign imports. And the food example is just one. Uh, in the Middle East, about 80% of all of the imports uh, our 80% of all the food is imported. That is, we're not uh, self-sustainable in terms of our agricultural needs. Um, on top of that, you have countries uh, like Egypt, for example, that heavily subsidize the import of food. So they're paying a lot of money to bring in a lot of food uh, and then selling that food cheaply to uh, members of the population, which because of the corruption and inefficiency I talked about before, uh, doesn't mean that the poorest people are actually getting the benefit of the subsidies. Uh, but it's putting the states in a very tough situation uh, in which food is not something that you can play around with. If you need to import all of your food and you fail to do so, or the food that you import is too expensive for your populations, well, you'll have a problem. And that's part of what happened with this perfect storm in 2010, uh, this kind of a problem. If you recall in 2008 and 2009, uh, we had a major global economic downturn uh, brought about by the subprime market in the United States, uh, which had major impacts across the world. And this global downturn uh, affected uh, pretty much every economy. And in the Middle East, where you had this already very tenuous balance of uh, things like uh, heavily subsidized food imports, well, the governments couldn't sustain that. Their, their currencies didn't have the value to be able to uh, keep this up. Uh, people were, who were already maybe not getting uh, the benefits of the subsidies, all of a sudden see subsidies being cut and the flows of food uh, uh, declining. They also see the unemployment rates going up and the uh, economic uh, conditions in the country getting worse as a result of this global downturn. So if you already have uh, uh, what you might say a very um, ineffective economic structure on which your country is based, major impacts in the global economy can certainly uh, influence you disproportionately to others. And that's part of what happened, I think, in many of the poorer uh, Arab nations which experienced the uprisings. So here we have the political and economic conditions, again, a very superficial view, uh, and I'm having to heavily generalize uh, in the interest of time. Uh, but let's now move into some of the social conditions. Now this I also have to be careful about because the social conditions, just like the economic conditions, vary a lot from one country to another. But we can see a few uh, common trends. One of them is that here in the Middle East, we, I guess, like to have babies. Uh, we have an issue with demography where the uh, global population uh, around the world, the age of the global population, uh, is actually increasing. That is, um, places that uh, have family planning and uh, uh, state uh, policies to try and regulate um, uh, birth rates have been largely successful. So you tend to have these large aging populations in places like Europe and the United States. But in the Middle East, uh, we have the opposite. We have very young populations. That is, rather than uh, two people getting married and uh, being replaced by, say, one or two kids, uh, they, having bigger families is very popular here. In the Gulf states, it's actually financially encouraged. Uh, in Kuwait, as a Kuwaiti citizen, uh, the more children I have, the more the state gives me uh, a subsidy to help uh, with my children. So in a sense, they're encouraging me to have uh, more families by reducing the economic, uh, bigger families by reducing the economic burden. So uh, the net result of this is what we call a youth bulge. That is a very large percentage of the population across the Middle East uh, is under the age of 30. Now the numbers vary depending on which period of time you're looking at and which set of statistics and reports. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that something like 60% of the population across the Middle East is under the age of 30. Um, we share some of this with uh, Africa as well, uh, but no other parts of the world have this same uh, demographic imbalance. Why is that important to the uprisings? Uh, 
Well, you can imagine if you have a large number of tech-savvy youth who are unemployed and unfed, uh, you have a very volatile uh, set of conditions. And I think this is part of the perfect storm, the issue of demog demography played into it. Religion. Um, the Middle East is always characterized as being almost mono-religious, as if Islam is the only religion. It's not the only religion, but it is certainly the dominant religion. And uh, because of the historical place of Islam in society uh, and in culture and in the history of it here in, in the Middle East, um, religion does play a very big role in a lot of people's lives. And it's been one of the uh, institutions, you might say, that, uh, that has been allowed to continue to flourish, where many of the autocratic governments have quelled any other kind of uh, uh, political opposition. Uh, they've restricted in many ways uh, civil society, as I'll talk about it in a second. Um, they have been pretty uh, tolerant in letting uh, religion and religious organizations uh, flourish. And this is significant because, as you'll see when we get to some of the dynamics that happened on the ground with the uprisings, the religious establishments across many of the uh, upri post-uprising states were the establishments that had the biggest social networks, they were the most politically organized, they were basically in the best position to capitalize on the new power vacuums uh, created by the departure of these uh, dictators. Gender. Um, now, I, I want to be careful, I don't want to overgeneralize the issue of, of gender. We have, uh, again, a lot of diversity in terms of how gender is ha handled uh, and its role within society across the region. Uh, our neighboring country, Saudi Arabia here, only recently gave women the right to vote. I mean, uh, the right to uh, drive. Uh, here in Kuwait, uh, we have uh, women who play a role in, in uh, politics and economics and education. So just our two neighboring countries have a lot of difference in terms of the role of gender. But largely, we could say that uh, the patriarchy that exists all over the world uh, is amplified in some degree, to some degree in many of the Arab countries. Uh, some definitely more than, than others. And uh, these social conditions also create a certain amount of uh, uh, repression and a lack of opportunities that we saw during the Arab uprisings that the, uh, the issue of women and their role in politics and, and, and culture uh, that, that, that started to come to the fore with a new force um, because of the historical repression of, of women in many parts of the Middle East. Education. Um, the educational systems uh, across the Middle East uh, vary as well, but you could say that in general they're not of the same caliber that we see in many other parts of the world, such as in uh, places like Singapore or uh, the United States or Western Europe. Um, and we're not talking here about tertiary education, uh, college level education necessarily, although it's relevant there too. But we're talking about uh, education in primary and secondary school. Uh, because education has been largely controlled by the states as, as part of their authoritarian approach to uh, managing the countries, um, the educational systems are ones that don't necessarily foster critical thinking. They don't teach people civics and, and democratic participation. They basically uh, are created to, uh, with more of a vocational and a rote learning approach, uh, which, why is this relevant for the uprisings? Well, it has a lot to do with people's expectations about what you do if you do all of a sudden have the opportunity to liberalize or democratize. People have not been educated uh, necessarily uh, in these uh, principles. And so it makes trying to manifest them into a reality very difficult. Civil society. Um, for those of you who don't know, civil society are uh, voluntary associations, NGOs, uh, different groups in society outside of the government um, and outside of, say, the private sphere or business, uh, which operate in all sorts of uh, ways. We can talk about uh, engineering societies, co-ops. We can talk about uh, nonprofit groups for the environment, etc. All of these are various civil society organizations. Largely speaking, many uh, governments across the Middle East have traditionally been a bit weary about civil society organizations. Uh, 
because democratic theory largely posits that uh, you need a strong civil society uh, for healthy democratic functioning. That is, you need these voluntary groups of people who associate and can discuss issues of, of common concern and, and uh, uh, use them to try and stimulate discussions uh, uh, for the government to consider and things like that. Because civil society was relatively weak, uh, although again, it varied from country to country, Egypt, for example, uh, had a lot of civil society organizations focused on issues of development and education uh, at the time of the uprisings. And they've certainly since then uh, tried to uh, quell the civil society sphere quite a bit. Um, but there were other places where civil society largely controlled by the state. This, like the education, um, limited the uh, ability of, uh, of groups to organize and to handle what was going to come uh, after the uprising started. We'll come back to that. Then you also have, uh, under the social conditions, a lot of competing identities. You have um, uh, tribalism, you have, of course, Islamism, you have Shia versus Sunni, uh, you have uh, Alawites, you have uh, Turkomans, you have uh, Kurds, you have all sorts of um, what you might say factionalized groups by which people uh, have increasingly tied their identity. And um, because there was an absence of civil society, an absence of civic education, uh, many of the political groups that we've seen form post uprisings have been either ones with a religious orientation or groups who uh, organize themselves based off of particular identities. Now, identity politics is nothing new. We see this everywhere in the world. Uh, but the kinds of uh, competing identities that we have in the region also uh, are relevant to what happened in the post-uprising environment. So again, we've gone through political, economic, uh, and social conditions. Um, let's talk uh, briefly here about the media environment. Because this is one of the, the things that we hear a lot when it comes to the Arab uprising. What was the, uh, what was the role of the, um, of the media? Particularly, what were the roles of social media? That's what most people tend to focus on. But I think it's also relevant to think about the role of international satellite broadcasting media uh, within the uprisings and the, uh, you might say, the international public sphere and how they conceptualized and covered them. So we had uh, all these other conditions that I've talked about uh, combined, again, in this perfect storm uh, with a new kind of media environment that hadn't been seen in the region. Now, to tell you about this, I've got to back up a little bit. And let's go back to the idea of authoritarianism. Just like the deep state gets involved in clientelism, it gets involved in the educational sector, it gets involved in civil society. Not surprisingly, the government plays a big role in uh, the traditional media environment. And historically, the media environments across the Middle East have been a combination or various uh, iterations of uh, state control on one side and uh, some free market activity on the other, um, but largely leaning toward the state control. Even in countries like Kuwait, which has the highest levels of media freedom historically uh, across the Middle East, uh, the government still plays a role in controlling the media environment, maybe not directly, uh, but through regulations and licensing and that sort of thing that can lead to a high degree of self-censorship. But when you talk about countries uh, such as Iraq, uh, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Yemen, etc., um, and even countries that weren't affected by the Arab uprisings as much, Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, the state control model has been uh, dominant. And uh, as a result, um, for a long time, the governments had complete control or a high degree of control over the information environment. Well, social media changes that. The internet changes that. Because no longer can the governments control as easily the flow of information coming in and out. They can put up firewalls, they can put up uh, uh, restrictions and censorship and all of that. Uh, China, for example, has done a very, you might say, impressive job at policing their internet space. But even there, they can't control it completely. Satellite television before that also started to create fissures, cracks in the way that the states controlled the media environment. And uh, we saw here at 2010, the rise of social media uh, 
to a new degree within the region. The state couldn't control all of these things. Um, the technology, people are using smartphones, uh, certainly the diffusion of smartphones, the diffusion of things like Facebook uh, uh, were very high uh, by 2010. Uh, do they cover all of the society? No, in places like Egypt, for example, um, there a lot of people couldn't afford them. But there was a very vocal group online uh, and having these technologies, uh, which, mind you, the government was trying to encourage because of their economic and market benefits, um, had some serious political implications. Uh, some of the ones we talk about in our book, for example, is when, uh, when you, the thing that's different about, say, uh, internet-based media like social media from, say, satellite-based media is it's two-way, it's interactive. Uh, that is, y the people using it are not just media consumers, they can also be media producers. And as a result of this, people can make media uh, products about all sorts of things, including if they're not happy with the government or if they want to highlight some kind of inefficiency or if they want to gather people for a protest. And we had seen some of this already happening in places like Iran and Egypt, etc., uh, in Kuwait, where social media had been used as a pretty potent political tool uh, prior to the 2010 uprisings. But by the time we get to 2010, uh, they were able to really capitalize on this experience and this technology in new ways. And some of the ways they did it that I mentioned here on the slide, one is something you might call preference amplification. That is, if you live in an authoritarian state, you probably are very cautious to talk to people about your concerns. If you're not happy with the way that the government is doing something, you may or may not talk to your neighbor about that because you don't know what their views are. But when you have an anonymous online space, you can. I'm sure you're all aware of this. It looks like a pretty young crowd, so I'm sure you're all online. Uh, and you know that you can talk about all sorts of things in an online space. And you could find people who share your political views, your orientations, your concerns much easier in this online space than you often can within a physical uh, authoritarian environment. It also has the ability to spotlight. That is to turn people's attention to gross negligences uh, conducted by governments. Uh, in Egypt, for example, uh, there was a case uh, of a young man who was uh, tortured by the police uh, and they set up a, a Facebook account um, about this, this young man and uh, drew a significant amount of attention uh, to something that people knew happened all the time in Egypt and that was uh, the Mukhabarat, the, the uh, secret police, uh, beating people uh, and sometimes killing them. And this led to some uh, early protests in places like Alexandria, all completely organized uh, through social media uh, by drawing attention to these, uh, this police brutality. Uh, we see this uh, a lot these days. It's not very new to many of you. But at the time that this happened, this idea of, of really drawing attention to gross negligence and abuses of power was still relatively new. Uh, the organizing and the mobilizing potential uh, getting people, setting schedules, saying let's all meet, for example, on the beach in Alexandria, all wearing the same color shirts, or let's all gather at this place at this time, uh, becomes very easy through social media. Uh, and you've seen this again and again uh, before, during, and since the Arab uprisings. Uh, the other thing that it does is social media um, helps strengthen something that we call weak ties. That is, you can start finding affiliations between groups and types of people that otherwise you may not meet in person, but because you share some kind of affiliation or concern, or you want to protest the same kind of things, you can build uh, coalitions and mobilize people uh, without necessarily even knowing who they are. And because of the two-way nature of, of uh, today's digital media, that is something that was a new set of factors. When you look at the, the way that people historically have talked about things like uprisings in the Middle East before, uh, the 2010-2011 series, you'll see them talking about the same things that I have, the political, economic, and social conditions, but very rarely do they talk about media. And that is something that was a bit different this time. Was it the only thing that led to the difference? No. There are plenty of countries that have social media that have many of the same conditions that did not uh, lead to uprisings. So I don't want to get into what we call technological determinism here. That is, it's the technology that created the revolutions.
But I want you to understand that the technology and the, the, the ways in which they've been employed were part of the, the, the set of conditions that came together to create the uprisings. Okay, so if you're all still awake, I'll move into the next, uh, the next section, which is uh, moving beyond what were the conditions that laid the groundwork for this and start talking about what were some of the dynamics we saw on the ground when they happened. Uh, again, we saw the major protest. We saw protests around the Middle East, but we saw the most major ones in uh, Tunisia, Yemen, Egypt, Bahrain, uh, Libya, and Syria. And we saw various responses to these. Not all of the regimes responded equally. Uh, some certainly more bloody than others. Um, so, in some cases, you have maybe the fight versus the flight. Certain uh, dictators uh, didn't have, for example, the military support behind them. They knew that there was no way to, uh, uh, to quell the rebellions, and they, uh, they gave up much easier than many people expected because they didn't have the force to put down uh, the, the uprisings. So instead they left. And we saw this in Egypt, we saw this in Tunisia, we saw this in Yemen, for example. But not all of the uh, dictators had the same approach. Um, for example, in Syria, uh, certainly Bashar al-Assad and his regime did not give up. Uh, you can see the, the, the civil war is still raging on to today. Uh, they've done everything they can uh, at uh, uh, gross uh, losses uh, to human life, to the infrastructure of the, of the country. Uh, etc. that are, I think, going to plague Syria for many generations just to hold on to power. You had some regimes that tried to, for example, uh, cut things off before they got out of control. Hosni Mubarak famously uh, cut off the internet because he said, oh, it's, it's a media thing, people are organizing themselves. Uh, he literally flipped the switch, you might say. He cut down the, uh, he shut down the ISP, the internet service providers, in the country and essentially turned off the internet for the entire country. Uh, they also tried to kill the cell phone network. Now, there's a number of problems with this. One, you're not just cutting down the protesters, you're stopping everything. Think about how much stuff we do using the internet and our phones. You can't just cut it down selectively. They shut it all off, which has some major uh, uh, impacts on business and economic function, functioning, education, etc. But his gamble was that if he could stop people from using the media to mobilize, uh, then he would be able to put them down easier. That turned out to be exactly the opposite. Once he shut down the Internet, well, if people couldn't find out what was going on on their phones, they walked out the doors. And they went out and the street protests actually increased following the shutdown of the internet, not decreased. Uh, and many of the regimes, uh, instead of trying to black things out, just as I said, backed out. They, they, they knew that uh, they couldn't do much. They tried to uh, give speeches on TV, for example, uh, uh, to explain that they understood what was going on. But uh, in the end, um, they knew that their best uh, strategy was to retreat and try fighting another day, which is what we see happening, for example, in Yemen at the moment. The militaries, I briefly mentioned that the militaries were key, and I think that they were. Um, the degree to which the government had strong control over the military had a lot to do with whether or not those governments stayed in power. Bashar al-Assad had cleverly designed his military in such a way that the entrenched interest of his particular uh, uh, groups were as such that uh, if the military tried to abandon him, they would be uh, undercutting themselves. Uh, we had the situation, for example, in Egypt again, where the military was uh, deeply entrenched into many aspects of the society, but decided not to support Hosni Mubarak uh, when he wanted to go in and, and continue slaughtering uh, protesters. They realized that it was actually in their best interest because they've spent a decades, you might say, of trying to build up a particular image of the military in Egypt, that they didn't want to shatter that. They would rather throw Hosni Mubarak to the dog, so to speak, than, uh, than to, to try and damage their own reputation. And in essence, they did. I mean, throwing him to the dog is probably the wrong metaphor. Let's just say throw him under the bus. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and they did. Um, with Zain al Abidin bin Ali in Tunisia, uh, it was very clear the military said, we're not going to kill the protesters, so you better get on a plane and leave, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the degree to which the military were willing to get engaged had a lot to do with uh, the degree to which the authoritarian uh, regime stayed in power. If we look at Bahrain, for example, which doesn't have a very uh, strong military presence itself, it's a very small island nation, uh, it turned to Saudi Arabia, its larger neighbor. And uh, Saudi Arabia sent in some of the initial forces, uh, military forces, to help put down the uprisings. But to try and uh, give it more legitimacy, they also uh, called on the coalition of the GCC, the Gulf Corporation Council countries, and uh, had them all send in uh, military forces. Now, not all of the countries were equally uh, on board with this idea, but they, they knew that they couldn't necessarily defy Saudi Arabia directly. Kuwait, for example, uh, was in a tight conundrum because we have a very active parliament here, and our parliament was very against uh, sending in uh, troops to Bahrain. And so what the government did was uh, send in uh, uh, ships, uh, the Marines, and uh, or, sorry, the Navy, and have the Navy uh, basically camp out outside of the island, but not really engage in the uh, direct quelling. But the net effect was the military or the uh, combination of militaries from around the GCC uh, were brought in to physically quell the uprisings. And hence, the same uh, Khalifa family that was in place during the uprisings is there today. Again, maybe on very shaky ground, but they are there. Um, the global community, what role did they play? Almost everything I've been talking about is really uh, the regional or the local conditions. Uh, but as the uprisings happened, we saw some very interesting things play out within the geopolitical environment. Uh, mixed reactions from many governments. The United States, for example, was caught between their continued rhetoric on one hand for uh, promoting democracy and freedom around the world. You all know about uh, America's rhetorical attempts at doing this. Uh, for example, their whole justification in many ways, uh, post-invasion justification for invading Iraq, has been around this idea of promoting freedom and democracy. So they found themselves in a very tight place where many of the dictators that they had been propping up with economic aid, Egypt, for example, uh, one of the largest recipients of U.S. aid on an annual basis, um, all of a sudden, they were between a rock and a hard place. Do we continue to support the dictators that we've been supporting for all these years and show that we are not in support of uh, the people's desires for, say, democracy or greater liberalization? Or do we have to throw in our lot with the, with the, the people, especially when they saw that dictators uh, like Zain Abedin Ben Ali uh, fall? They, they realized we'll end up looking like we're on the wrong side of history if we continue to support the, the regimes we've been sort of supporting for so long. So they threw in their lot with uh, the publics, more or less, and uh, left the dictators out to dry. You can imagine that for those, uh, those regimes that stayed in power, their uh, faith in the United States continuing to support them in the long term has been uh, grossly shaken. Um, in terms of the media, I think the media now, here we're not talking about people's use of social media, but we're talking about the global media, played a very big role, especially uh, organizations like Al Jazeera Arabic. Uh, but many, uh, whether you turn on the BBC, CNN, or Al Jazeera during the uprisings, they all had a very similar, what we call a grand narrative. Uh, as a media scholar myself, I could probably talk about this for quite a long time, but in essence, when, when the media try and explain what's going on in the world, they often try and put it within a story, call it a narrative. And the grand narrative of the Arab uprisings was pretty consistent in the beginning, that the people are rising up against these evil dictators in order to install democracy and, and take back their countries. It's a gross oversimplification. Not everybody was protesting looking for democracy, uh, but they certainly wanted more uh, uh, social justice, more economic uh, freedom, more political say in what was going on, but not necessarily Western-style democracy. The um, 
the, the danger of presenting things in terms of this narrative is then uh, the groups that were supposed to, that, that came in to try and fill the vacuum uh, when dictators were deposed were expected to be democratic, and we saw that they weren't. Again, to use the case of Egypt, uh, we saw the Muslim Brotherhood uh, come in and take power and uh, by popular vote. As I mentioned, the Islamic organizations were some of the most organized and the best examples of, uh, uh, of, of uh, social groups that could step into the power vacuum after the uprisings, and they did. Um, but then it left the rest of the world scratching their heads, saying, wait a minute, these are not the Democrats that we said were supposed to take over, that we expected were supposed to take over. And I think a lot of those expectations came around to the ways in which these grand narratives were perpetuated uh, through the media and through political commentators. They expected a democratic contagion, that is, that like a cold, uh, democracy could be something that you catch from one place to the other, and that once you caught it and you were in sort of infected with democracy, uh, and that proved not to be the case in any way, pretty much. While Tunisia has come some way in creating some more liberalized and democratic, democratically oriented institutions, uh, they're still not a democracy. And of course, uh, the whole thing had a high degree of spectacle. It was captivating to watch and people were tuned into it. And this made it so that the whole world that was watching these uprisings did hear or be exposed to this grand narrative. And it's hard not to be influenced by that kind of narrative because let's face it, in every kind of pop culture or media that we consume, pretty much you expect a happy ending, uh, but that's not necessarily what's happened here. So those were some of the responses by the regimes, the militaries, the global community. What were some of the initial outcomes? Now, in the very beginning, uh, many of the protesters were young, as I said, the, the youth bulge that we had, tech-savvy, uh, liberal-thinking uh, groups. But these groups uh, didn't necessarily reflect the whole of society. And while they were quite good at uh, the different effects I talked about, like spotlighting and mobilization, these groups were not positioned in any way, shape, or form to know how to govern. They had no experience. They had no plan. There were no uh, manifestos, so to speak, as to exactly what it is that they wanted. They had relatively loose, generic ideas about, uh, again, democracy or liberalization or more social justice, uh, but they did not have uh, a plan and they didn't have the players to step in. And so it was very uh, quick that when it looked like this sort of Facebook revolution of the youth, uh, it turned out to be that they were not the ones who capitalized on uh, the fall of many of the dictators. We did see in the immediate aftermath uh, a rise of a lot of um, ambitions and hopes. And I think this is perhaps some of the most uh, tragic stuff to think about is we got to see uh, some insight into just the nature of how many people wanted things better and what kind of things they wanted better for themselves that have not materialized. We saw, for example, within the field of the media, new programs, new television stations, new forms of news and entertainment. We had an Egyptian version of Jon Stewart, for example, pop up. Uh, all sorts of um, uh, ambitions about creating a free public sphere for people to debate and discuss things. Most of that is gone now. We saw women step up and exert uh, some kind of influence on the discourse to say we've had enough of, of being relegated to uh, a status less than men. Uh, we, we want to have our political and our social rights. Uh, we want to end things like discrimination and sexual harassment. We want to be uh, more free. Now, not all women had exactly the same uh, articulation of their desires. But we certainly saw uh, gender as an issue that came very quickly to the forefront uh, of the protest uh, movements. We saw new artistic uh, expressions and aspirations across the region. Um, and all of these were very promising at the time that they happened. Uh, and in many ways, most of them have rolled back. Although in Tunisia, they did uh, come up with a parody law, that is, and we talk about this in our book, uh, 
they came up with a, a, a law that um, the political groups that run for the Tunisian uh, governmental positions uh, need to have an equal number of female and male candidates. Um, other places came up with quota systems for their uh, country that allowed women to uh, more uh, potential say in governance. But uh, most of these have not panned out the way that they were expected. Importantly, we saw new forms of national and regional pride. People proud to be from their country. People proud to see how uh, everybody was defying uh, death or the people who were protesting were defying death and, and the possibility of incarceration just to express their desires. Uh, and this was manifested again through many artistic expressions, new forms of hip hop and new forms of art and new forms of uh, uh, media products uh, being uh, produced um, that really, I think, uh, highlighted the issue of dignity, something that for many years people felt had been trampled on. Uh, by the regimes. Um, and of course, there was some discussion uh, amongst the various groups about, yes, let, let's do move toward democracy. Even if we haven't necessarily had the education, uh, we know roughly what we want. But again, not all groups in the end uh, have come to an agreement. And let's face it, when it comes to the issue of democracy, uh, agreement is not something that's inherent in the system. Uh, but it did open up dis uh, new discussions uh, about this. Um, but those initial promising outcomes, I think, unfortunately, did not manifest into uh, the medium term. As I said, uh, the, uh, the Islamists stepped into the power vacuum in a major way. The um, economic and political conditions which people were protesting in many ways got worse, not better. Currencies devalued, unemployment uh, rose, productivity declined, uh, civil wars erupted, uh, people died, young men uh, being taken out of the workforce and, and, and slaughtered in many ways. Uh, gruesome conditions. Uh, and if people were originally protesting the desire to eat, for example, uh, in many of the countries, even seven years on, uh, their dreams have not been realized very well because the economies are still suffering greatly. Uh, look at Iraq, look at Yemen, look at Egypt, look at Libya. They face lots of problems. Um, I talked about how uh, some of the geopolitical players led to new realignments, um, and we're seeing this still play out. The United States has retreated in a big way from the Middle East. Uh, we see Turkey playing a new role. We see Russia playing a very significant role in what's happening in uh, Syria. The uh, continual boogeyman, you might say, that they use in this part of the world of Iran and trying to make things appear as if it's sectarian in nature, the, the, the geopolitical balance of the region, the Shia versus the Sunni, uh, has turned into, I think, a, a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in which the power of Iran to step in has, uh, uh, has been opened, not quelled. For example, uh, the role of Iran in Yemen uh, was, uh, was spurred in many ways by Saudi Arabia's uh, involvement there. We look now, for example, at the boycott uh, by Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and others uh, against Qatar. Uh, they're trying to put pressure on Qatar to bring it in line with uh, their ambitions. And as a result, they've opened up the opportunity through their blockade for Qatar to start trading with Iran, start trading with uh, Turkey. So we're seeing all these new uh, realignments that in many ways are very much against uh, what the traditional hegemons in the region wanted. Uh, these new power vacuums have created new players and new dependencies, which I think will uh, do a lot to shape the, the region for the years to come. And for those governments who managed to survive the uprisings, let's talk about the GCC for an example. Uh, the, the, the club of monarchies, you might say, uh, countries that weren't republics but have um, royal families. You've got uh, Saudi Arabia, you have the UAE, you have Bahrain, you have Kuwait, uh, etc. Um, Oman, but you also have uh, Jordan, 
and uh, and uh, uh, Morocco, who were temporarily invited to join the Gulf Corporation Council in some silly gesture. Uh, the idea was let's as monarchs share our resources, our ideas, uh, and uh, and our approaches to making sure that we stay in power. And we're seeing, for example, in Kuwait, a country which has had uh, high degrees of uh, media and political freedoms compared to all of our neighbors, uh, a renewed effort by the government to uh, to come more in line with uh, the the ways in which our neighboring countries seek to govern. And uh, this kind of circling of the wagons, new security packs, new laws, new regulations uh, are pretty new for us here in Kuwait. And they're, I think, a direct result of the fear that was instilled in the monarchs and many of the other uh, countries uh, about the possibility that they could be overthrown by the populations. So they're becoming stronger, not weaker. And uh, then let's talk about the people. People's aspirations that I was talking about in the previous slide have in many ways been quelled. Uh, you have places like, let's say, Palestine or Lebanon or Jordan, which stood by and watched what was going on with great interest and wondered, should we or should we not? Because uh, they, in all of those places, knew Algeria as well, uh, that things could get worse, not better, when you try and rise up. And sure enough, at least in the midterm, things look worse all around, as I've just described. And this has, I think, made a lot of people lose their appetite for the idea that the way to political change is revolution or uprisings. Um, doesn't mean that people haven't changed their concerns, uh, but it certainly tempered their expectations about how they could try and lead to some kind of uh, political change. And these rapid upheavals as an approach uh, haven't looked very desirable. If they see that their neighboring Arabs and other countries that went through the uprisings are worse off rather than better off, uh, they're a little hesitant about trying to think of doing something in their own countries. So you've got the governments getting stronger, people's ambitions getting weaker, uh, economies uh, uh, also being weak and power vacuums uh, being filled by various groups. Iraq is another example where uh, the Islamic State has stepped into a broken, uh, dysfunctional state and was able to exert a high degree of power and influence, uh, although uh, through military efforts this is being declined, but their ideology won't be squished by military power. So uh, we're going to continue to see the these outcomes uh, manifesting and, and festering uh, for some time to come. So just real quick, uh, I'm, I know we're just about at an hour and I want to leave time for Q&As. Uh, let me talk about where we are now. The title of the presentation that I, I'm giving, uh, that was given to me, was to talk about glorification. Is it warranted to think that the uprisings were just glorifications? Well, we are saying that it, they weren't necessarily revolutions, but they have been reconstitutions. They have changed things. For the better or worse, I think it's uh, certainly in... in as we look at it right now for the worst, what it means for the long term, uh, it's too early to tell. Um, and as I've said, uh, part of the reason for this is that in the absence of the power that was in place by many of the dictators who were deposed, uh, new groups stepped in, uh, which aren't necessarily any more democratic, in many cases less democratic, uh, if you could say that, than the ones who were in place before. Uh, or reiterations of the old regime uh, find their way back into power. We also see a tragic human cost in terms of lives, in terms of displacement, disruptions. The number of people to be displaced out of the Middle East, it's one of the largest disruptions and, and forced migrations of people uh, in the history of mankind. Uh, you all know about this, I think, as you look at... Uh, people migrating into Europe from uh, Syria and Iraq and, and Yemen and elsewhere um, is not in the news as much as it was for a while, but the problem is still there and it's a long-term problem that will need to be dealt with. Uh, and these new coalitions, as I've said, the new reformation of the geopolitical sphere 
is also something that um, if I was to answer the question, do I think the glorifications of the uprisings as these uh, democratic moments were warranted? No, I think people were too quick to jump into that grand narrative. But does that mean that something better m might never come? I would also say no. We can look at the, uh, these things from a somewhat objective uh, perspective and talk about um, uh, freedom rankings and uh, measures of democracy. And there are many organizations such as Freedom House that do this. And if you're interested, you can plot over time the degree to which various kinds of uh, political, social media freedoms change. Uh, and I have a feeling that in the long term, even though they're down now, they may go elsewhere, which takes us to the trajectories. Um, realignments will continue. Democracy's prospects are unknowable. Every country was unique, even though it looked like they were all falling like dominoes because of these similar underlying factors. But it's clear that each country is going to find its own path, and that path may or may not have much to do with democracy. But the people's aspirations for more political uh, involvement, uh, more dignity, more social justice, and a better quality of life, those are there, and they're, they're there with uh, fervor. But how to make them happen, we have to see. Uh, I expect that the instability will still persist for quite some time, at least a generation, probably. Uh, but at some point, we'll have to see uh, what are the conditions, the coalitions, and the circumstances that might lead some countries to be more stable than others. Um, and we can talk about this if you want to get into details uh, later. So the parting thoughts. Um, not only do these desires still continue, even though the conditions are looking worse for achieving them, but we're still seeing people being defiant. I started off the lecture by talking about Mohammed Bouazizi, who set himself on fire. The New York Times recently did a, an article talking about self-immolation, setting yourself on fire, as a form of protest that's gained increasing popularity in Tunisia. And um, the numbers were quite surprising. Uh, in 2016 alone, in one Tunisian hospital, there were 104 cases of people setting themselves on fire, trying to protest, as Mohamed Bouazizi did, the conditions that they're seeing in Tunisia. Now, that's Tunisia, the country that is supposed to be doing the best in the post-uprising environment. And yet people are still very dissatisfied with the conditions that they see. So I think that we will see this desire for change persisting no matter what. But we have to change our expectation of what kind of time frame we're thinking about. We need to think more in terms of what the French would call the long durée, which is the long-term uh, prospects. These are not short-term things. Political upheaval is uh, very much a long-term. It's not the du jour, what is the, 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 the thing of the day. Uh, they're really much more than that. And I think we can look to the same European revolutions of 1848 that Mark Lynch used to try and describe the Arab Spring as a spring. Uh, these were called the European Spring of Nations or the Autumn of Nations, uh, where a number of countries across uh, uh, Europe in 1848 went, over, uh, went into a, a significant wave of revolutions or upheavals, just like we saw within the Middle East. But important to note, democracy did not come to uh, Europe immediately after that. It took generations, and each country found its own path and developed its own set of political institutions and structures according to its own understanding of uh, what it needed to, to have. And those are still, in some ways, not as consolidated as they could be. We still see that the kinds of political institutions that were developed in Europe don't always prevent things like a tyranny of a majority or a rise of a dangerous right or all of that. You just have to read the news to see that. So if Europe has taken generations from the 1848 revolutions, or if we talk about the very famous French Revolution uh, from 1789, from the storming of Bastille uh, until Napoleon was crowned emperor, kind of the, the two endpoints used to talk about the French Revolution, uh, that alone took 15 years. And Napoleon isn't what I would call the world's best Democrat. Uh, 
so we're looking at a very long-term expectation before we can start to see whether the uh, cracks built into the system through the uprisings in 2010 and, and moving on will turn into at some point uh, a more stable, a more prosperous, and uh, a more uh, responsive Middle East to the needs of its uh, populations. So thank you for uh, listening to me talk for an hour and 10 minutes uh, directly. Most of my students won't make it that long uh, before they fall asleep or play on their phones. So thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Q&A. And I'll just ask when you speak in the microphone, please speak up loudly uh, because the sound that I get is not uh, very loud from my end. And I will do my best to answer your questions for the next 10 to 20 minutes. Okay, let me first uh, ask everyone to give a round of applause to Dr. El Samit for a very informative lecture. Thanks, Professor. Uh, I actually have one question for the start of all the revolutions around the beginning of Arab Spring. So do you think that group thing was a factor that um, caused the domino effect that, uh, you know, essentially kick-started the entire Arab Spring from Tunisia to Libya to the rest of the Arab countries? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, you what, if you could just clarify what you mean by the group thing. Um, just the, the psychological effect where people think oh. about uh -huh. that it, it's success, it might be a possible success to um, overthrow the um, dictatorship like in Tunisia, which caused them to uh, essentially start their own revolutions in their own states. And as it goes around, uh, people of the same um, strata come together to maintain unity rather than um, make a rational choice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, so you said, I think you said group think, and, and I heard group thing. Oh. Uh, okay. So I understand now. You're basically talking about the to what role uh, was there this uh, uh, group effect by uh, a mob mentality, you might say, by seeing uh, other people being successful. Did that inspire uh, others to try and rise up? Absolutely. I think this was a key part of it. And I think that traditionally, uh, when I talk uh, briefly about the fact that there have been literally dozens of upheavals and uprisings and protest movements uh, since the end of World War I, all across countries throughout the Middle East, why were they not as successful? Well, part of the reason was that people didn't really know about them. And I think that's different in today's globalized uh, media saturated environment that they could, that one, the, the people in uh, Libya and Egypt could see what was happening in Tunisia and say, that was easier than it looked. Let us try the same kind of thing. Now, it wasn't an equally easy in every country, as I said. And certainly uh, in the beginning where there might have been this group mentality of, oh, look, everybody's doing this. We can do this now, too. And I think there was a big part of that. Uh, I think different countries saw that different dictators, different militaries, different geopolitical groups were uh, producing very different responses. And then it became not everybody's doing it and we're all going to end up in the same place. It became everybody who's tried to do this has uh, come up with different results. And I think that the same thing, the same group think, maybe as you would call it, uh, that inspired people to get involved in the uprisings, is having the opposite effect now. They're seeing the, 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 the horrible uh, direct consequences of the uprisings, and they're saying, okay, everybody is getting a bad turn out of this. Uh, let us be cautious. So yes, I think this plays a very big role. Us as human beings, we often make our decisions based off of what we see other people around us doing, uh, whether for positive or for negative. That's certainly been the case here. Thank you, that's a good question. Anyone else? Hi, um, I would just like to ask, 
Um, would you say that more good things came out of the revolution, or like you still see a lot of unrest and um, yeah, yeah? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I would say it's hard to characterize things as just good or bad. I would say that uh, if we look at the initial uh, dynamics on the ground of what came out of the uh, revolutions, that is, in the moments in which they were happening, a lot of good things came out. We saw uh, people expressing themselves in ways that they were always too afraid to do. Um, I mentioned about the, the artistic uh, expressions, uh, new gender discussions coming to the fore, uh, new forms of media being developed. These were all very positive and promising signs. So yes, a lot of good things did come out in the beginning. But it didn't take very long before a lot of bad things uh, came out as well. And that is the power vacuums being filled by people who might be worse than the people who held power before. By the economic and social conditions that were so terrible in the beginning, uh, actually getting even worse after the uprisings, uh, that was quite negative. Um, but like I said in the, the final slide, it's important not to think about things just in terms of better and worse. Uh, it's important to think about things in terms of time. And if we're going to see improvements, uh, I think that the improvements that might have been caused in some way, shape, or form by the events that transpired in 2010 and 2011 uh, will uh, maybe not be entirely apparent or easy to draw a direct line between them uh, until probably something like 2027 or 2037. Um, I think we're in this for the long haul. Uh, it's clear that people want something different. Many populations across the Middle East are not happy with the status quo. The big question is, one, what can they do about it? And two, uh, what kind of system needs to replace what's already there? And the uh, Western-style democracy approach is proven too elusive or uh, too unresponsive uh, for a lot of people. Um, I think it will have to be something much more indigenous, something that people say, we're not just taking a model from the West, but we're designing something ourselves. You can use Iraq as a good example of this. When the U.S. coalition came in and invaded Iraq, uh, they put in place what's called a consociational system. That is, they developed a new political system that they called democratic, uh, but mistakenly, I think, they said, okay, we need a power-sharing system where we have one main power group is going to be represented in, in the political system by the Kurds, one by the Shia, and one by the Sunni. Lebanon has a similar kind of thing, uh, Shia, Sunni, and uh, Christian. But by creating a political system in which uh, power sharing is tied to your ethnic or your religious identity, uh, you're not creating democracy. You're creating a, a, a petri dish for competition and, and problems. People don't choose to get involved politically based off of their own ideology, whether they're for the right or for the left or for certain kinds of principles. They have to form their political groupings based off of something that they were born into, their ethnic or their religious background. And I think that this creates major problems. So when we say, is it better? Is there something good that comes out of it? Well, whatever political systems may end up evolving within this part of the world, they certainly can't be imported as they tried to do in Iraq. Uh, because as we can see, uh, it's now 12 years since the invasion of Iraq, and they look worse off in many ways than they did at the start of the invasion. One more question here, Dr. El Samit, just bear with us. Okay. If you can just stand up. Oh. Um, I was wondering if you can comment on the persistence of the deep state, um, because you were mentioning that new systems should be in place, but to what extent does the deep state prevent new systems from coming up? Yes, thank you, good question. Um, part of the reason why deep states uh, become entrenched as they do is exactly to prevent some kind of change in the political order. That is, you make a state that's involved in everything from uh, the economy to the education, uh, the security apparatus, etc. 
and you make people dependent on the state for that to perpetuate, uh, it makes it very hard for that to be disruptive. We see this, for example, um, I've used Egypt a lot. Uh, let's talk about uh, one of the other nations here. Uh, let's talk about Tunisia. Tunisia had a deep state, um, but they tried to uh, reconstitute that state in such a way uh, that there are new kinds of political institutions, new kinds of political organizations and groups, new forms of civil society, all trying to redraw the map, so to speak. And part of what makes it so difficult, part of the reason why there's still so many self-immolations in Tunisia and still so much frustration and security concerns and elsewhere, is that they're literally trying to, it's like uh, removing a cancer. They're literally trying to dig out everything that was already in place uh, that had been built exactly to withstand this kind of a change. Uh, and so, of course, they're going to struggle. But the deep state in a place like Egypt, where uh, organizations like the military were so embedded into the fabric of society, it made it so the, the, the military became more or less the power brokers. They get to decide. Uh, who gets to stay and who doesn't stay, who they want to support, who they don't want to support. And because they have that deep state sort of uh, institutionalism, um, they have that authority and they are quite resistant to any kind of change. Uh, the ability to remove the military from the picture in Egypt is uh, almost uh, untenable. You can almost not picture it. The same kind of thing happened in, in Turkey. Turkey had a, a deep state. They had a military that played a big role in the reconstitution of that state and that built into the constitution certain provisions and protections uh, for them uh, that has taken decades to try and reverse, to try and bring the military more under civilian control. And now that they've got it more under civilian control, those mechanisms of the deep state were still entrenched enough that we see uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan now the, the, the ruler of Turkey, uh, taking advantage of this. And he is entrenching himself uh, into a new form of a deep state. So he's basically helped to push out the military. They use democracy as an opportunity to take power. And then now that he's in power, he's uh, used that to reconstitute the state uh, into the image that he wants. And uh, the attempted coup in Turkey really brought this to the forefront, uh, in which... He used that attempted coup as an opportunity to purge literally any potential, not even just opposition, but potential for opposition. Closing down schools, kicking out professors, uh, cracking down on the media, etc. Groups that maybe had nothing at all to do with the attempted coup were targeted under the, uh, the, the pretense that they were a threat to the state. And now we see Erdogan, who was elected democratically, uh, controlling a deep state uh, autocratically. And so when you ask, you know, what is the role of the deep state? Well, it makes it possible for, uh, you might be able to take a autocracy and turn it into a democracy as they did in, uh, Turkey and as they're trying to do in Tunisia, but there's no guarantees that it won't go slip right back into an autocracy. Thank you for that question. Anybody have any last questions or one more question? I'm a follow up on the previous question asked about deep state. Do you think that the history of deep state in the region um, essentially culturally changed the preference of the people there such that Mm, liberal institutions might not be um, appealing to for them or does not suit the preference or the culture of the people there. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, good question and one that actually comes up quite a bit. Um, are people basically conditioned to the lot in life that they've been given? Uh, my first caution would be to say um, we can't speak about all the people in the same way. One of the things that came out of the Arab uprising was to see the diversity of opinions and interests uh, that exist across the region, and they are quite diverse. Uh, 
but the uh, point is well taken. Has uh, living under a deep state made people uh, so that the only thing that they're capable of really wanting or understanding would be more deep state? Well, you certainly see this argument. You see the argument uh, come up sometimes that, oh, you see, when you, when you let the lid off uh, of the control over these countries in the Middle East, you can see that uh, they fall apart. And so really the only solution is you need to have a strong man dictator, and of course man, a strong man dictator that, uh, that keeps the population under control. You see this argument used again and again, and largely used by either dictators themselves, the ones who manage to stay in power, uh, or by uh, uh, company, uh, countries with a geopolitical interest in uh, keeping certain aspects of the status quo as they are. That is, they say, oh, look, the people have to be ruled by fear and intimidation um, because that's all they know. Uh, I would say that's largely false. Um, people, no matter where they are, want to have some say in their own lives. Uh, those of you who are kids, uh, you know, you're all kids of somebody, those of you who are parents, uh, you know children, for example, uh, like to defy their parents a lot because they want to have some control uh, over their own decisions, whether it's their bedtime or brushing their teeth. That's an inherent nature, and I think when you extrapolate that to societies, people want to have some say. If they can't, don't have jobs, if they don't have food, if they don't have uh, potential for opportunities and growth, and yet they do have uh, media that show them the rest of the world living a better lifestyle than many of them are living, um, of course they're going to want to have something, be able to do something about it. Now, is everybody equally politically engaged? No. A lot of people, they don't care. Um, you can even look at consolidated Western democracies, look at the turnout rate for the votes. Even people that have the right to do something to make their lives better often don't make the effort. So that's why I don't want to overgeneralize and say, okay, yes, uh, uh, people here either A, can only live under uh, control because they were culturally conditioned for that, or B, that everybody here wants to be able to uh, take full control over their lives and engage in democratic politics. It's neither, uh, but it's both. You will have some people that they don't know any better, and when they look at the outcomes of the uprisings, they say, well, uh, we'd rather have some stability and less control over our lives. And you have other people who say, wait a minute, we wanted change, and what we got was more of the same, but worse. We want more change. That's why I think we will see in the future um, more efforts at political change in this part of the world. I don't think it will be sustainable to keep uh, uh, populations down. And I should, again, emphasize the point that not all countries keep populations down the same way. Uh, I live in a country where I feel like we have a high degree of freedom. I mean, I'm talking to you over the Internet about uh, uh, regional geopolitics uh, without feeling that I need to censor anything because I'm in a country where I can I can do that. I'm in a country where I have political representatives that I can talk to about my concerns and expect them to debate it in parliament and, and try and fight for my interests. Uh, but other countries maybe don't have any of that. So um, I wouldn't say there's a cultural tendency toward authoritarianism. I would say there's a historical tendency toward authoritarianism that has created conditions that make it very hard to break away from that. And I think that there are some people who would be willing to continue to fight for that. And I think that there are plenty of people who don't have the stomach to fight for it. And I think that each country has a different set of conditions to determine whether or not those who want to see a change are able to push for one versus countries where people are quite complacent with what they've got. But in no way, shape or form do I think that there's uh, a cultural bias toward authoritarianism. I think it's historical. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Anybody have? All right. Okay. So since that will be the last question, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Dr. Fahad, for, for the lecture. Everyone give a round of applause.